Good morning. This is Ron McFarland coming to you from my home office. It's a bit messy, but today we're going to do a cybersecurity update for August 26, 2022. Uh, again, my email is listed on that front page. I'll put it in the comments on the YouTube video. My LinkedIn profile as well and a website. So let's get started. Our topics today really boil around several items. Who sponsors the most cyber attacks? So we can probably guess who? Also, ransomware victim paid the ransom and they got burnt. Another story about this. Uh, oftentimes you'll pay the ransomware fee and you won't get your files back nor something else happens. So we'll look into that story. Airline tech provider hit uh, company hit with ransomware. And of course, a lot of these larger companies support many other companies. So the target is really these cr the crux, if you will, trying to get to these big providers like MSPs or other software vendors that might support dozens, if not hundreds or thousands. Anyway, DOD releases its social media policy. Finally, we'll talk a bit about that. Ransomware attack divulges uh, data for essentially a million patients. DDoS, the good old distributed denial of service attack, cripples university platforms on the first day of school. Certainly, I was impacted. I had to do a workaround, and so were my students as well. Another popular router identified with vulnerabilities, and we'll briefly talk about that. Now, just a few notes. I do want to make a few comments about this presentation and other presentations uh, that I've posted. First off, the information that I've shared. By the way, I'm not going to edit out any goofs that I have. I'm just going to give it straight up. So if I knock my microphone, spill my drink, I'm going to keep going forward. It's not going to be this professionally edited video. So information gathered is from publicly accessible and available sources. There's no sensitive information divulged in my presentations. Content is presented for educational purposes. Items presented here are under the fair use copyright. I do provide links to the content that I've used, and I actually, uh, it's in the reference section. So if you're a, a student, a learner of any kind, uh, a researcher, you have those references. I haven't put them in any kind of format. So if you're an academic, you'll probably want to take those references, reshape them into APA or MLA, etc. Higher Vista. Um, I post a lot of educational content under YouTube. I do some writing under Medium. Uh, just my focus is to support the IT cybersecurity learner. Uh, feel free to share these presentations, share this content, and also like the content. That way I get to kind of get a gauge to see if this is reaching an audience, if you will. Um, I'm not a YouTuber. You can see I don't have a fancy background. That's all the junk in my office. Maybe in the future I will clean it up to make it a little more presentable. But um, that's the way it is right now, just straight up stuff. Um, who sponsors the most cyber attacks? You probably guessed it, it's Russia and China. And you were right. The advent of cyber terrorism has created a new front for global warfare. You know, if you can do things sitting in an office or a set of offices, um, it may have much more of an impact than lobbying missiles or bombs. So that's the area we're really into. Um, according to the Council on Foreign Relations, CFR, Cyber Operations Tracker, which is one of the items they do, I provided the link here and I put it in the comments as well. Russia has been responsible for 27 known attacks so far in 2022. So we're at August 27, China's 24. And CFR put out this graph right here. You can see Russia's on top, China, um, North Korea, um, again, they get a lot of support from both Russia and China, Iran as well, uh, Palestine, and on down the food chain, if you will. So North Korea, only nine, Iran, only eight so far. Uh, the rise in cyber attacks is a major cause for alarm. Now, one of the, it mentions on the slide here, and I, I use the information from the articles. It mentions blackouts, denial of service, but one area of concern is Let's say here, I'm in Flagstaff, Arizona, for example. Uh, we have large water towers, just like other municipalities. Uh, it, they're all networked here. Um, I don't know what the posture is here, so I'm just talking in general terms. But for the most part, municipalities, whether it's counties, 
local governments that own such facilities are um, have been running really in a real vulnerable manner. Imagine if an attacker decided to dump water from large municipalities and then we'd have a major issue, issue until those are restored. Same with utilities as well. Countries will have to implement, countries, counties, municipalities, more cybersecurity. Otherwise, it will be difficult for, heck, Flagstaff even to keep up, keep attacks at bay as they start rolling out. So that's the biggest concern. The next item on the list, ransomware victim paid the ransom, then got burned. We, all, we hear this over and over. Uh, it's been a long-standing U.S. government position and a recommendation to treat ransomware demands uh, like you're treating with terrorists. No, no negotiation, no payments. However, in August 2021, a year ago, Black Matter, Matter a ransomware group, used a phishing email to compromise the account of a single victim at an undisclosed location. So this gets back to user training, really. Somebody received perhaps an email of some sort and clicked on um, a corrupted document or a link, and that let black matter the attackers into the system. Uh, the ransomware allowed the hacker group to expand their access by moving laterally across the infrastructure, ultimately leading to the point where they were able to install hacking tools and steal sensitive data. So they were in somebody's system for a few weeks, few months, if you will, snooping around, escalating their privileges. The attackers appear to have had access to the network for at least a few weeks or a few months uh, before being undetected. Uh, going undetected, excuse me. See, no editing here. <laughs> and, of course, files were encrypted. Ransomware was proposed. Bitcoin, of course, less traceability. There is a way to do some tracking on that. Now, the group, this organization paid Black Matter, and still Black Matter released the data a few weeks later on the dark web, probably asking for more money to, to leverage that. So sometimes you can't trust the hackers, right? Anyway, airline tech company. Here, this is another example where uh, targets are being uh, um, uh, the crosshairs of a target uh, on a large company that provides infrastructure services. Because uh, uh, I, I don't know if I'm saying this right. Acelia, A C C E L A, Acelia. Sorry, Acelia, if you're watching this. A technology firm providing services to 250 airlines, including Delta, British Air, JetBlue, United Virgin, Atlantic, American Airlines. Um, confirmed this Tuesday, a few days ago, uh, that uh, the company data was posted on a leaked site. 250 airlines use this. A spokesperson from Acelia, I hope I'm saying that right, <laughs> uh, quoted is quoted as, our forensic investigators confirmed it was limited to a contained portion of our overall environment. We have no evidence to indicate that the malware could have moved laterally from our systems to customers customers' environments. I don't particularly really trust that spokesperson, but it's it's a way for them to say, hey, we're, we're really sort of kind of protecting you. I would be cautious on that. The airline industry has been ripe for hacker ransomware targets uh, this year, especially since the pandemic of the prior year and a half plus. Now everyone's traveling, so you've got a lot of information flowing along with uh, customers as well. So there you go on that one. Never trust, never trust. Trust it, but verify. I don't know if I really, I would say don't trust and verify. <laughs> DOD finally releases its social media policy. We've seen for years that uh, different um, people on social media, uh, whether they are uh, working with the Army, Navy, etc., or as a contractor, releasing sort of information that goes crazy on the on the web. For example, I've seen it where somebody might be uh, a contractor, and they're saying, hey, you know, I'm supplying parts for the DOD, and look at this cool little part. I'll take a picture of it. I just created it today, and it's for the F-35. Anyway, DOD finally released uh, uh, an a policy on Monday detailing how military and civilian personnel, contractors as well, should use official social media accounts to further the department's missions, mandating that improper accounts 
uh, be reported to that social media platform. So improper accounts, this gets into a whole mash of things. Improper accounts, you reported. I've reported many things to YouTube for having improper content, especially in the K through 12. I'm a university professor, but I also try to uh, support our local uh, school system as well as other school systems. Uh, honestly, my observation is that when you report something through YouTube or to Facebook, my observation is that they don't do anything. So, uh, so the DOD released a policy. Uh, here's a quote. Users, malign actors, and adversaries on social media platforms may attempt to impersonate DOD employees and service members to disrupt online activity, uh, distract audiences from official accounts, discredit DOD information, or manipulate audiences through dis disinformation campaigns. So I think of... Um, Twitter as one example of some wonky stuff that has happened on Twitter. Not only uh, do we have employees, contractors taking pictures, but we also have people um, impersonating others. It's a big, big deal, if you will. I will read the last bullet. Specifically, social media accounts and content should meet defined objectives and personnel should exercise professional and ethical standards, as well as provide inspiring and engaging content on and on. That gets me thinking about the difference between policy and procedure. They're setting out a policy. A policy is like a thou shalt do it. Thou shalt, a policy would be thou shalt file your taxes. Okay, certainly a gray area. Thou shalt file your taxes once a year. That would be a policy that the government sets for all of us. How you do it, the procedure, policy versus procedure, that's not defined here. So this is the thou shalt have a social media accounts and content should meet defined objectives. Those haven't been really defined by each department yet. Um, and personnel should exercise professional and ethical standards. Those haven't been defined by each relevant department yet. And so that will then trigger this social media policy, will trigger a wash of various, hopefully more co cohesive uh, procedures that uh, each department, each agency will uh, unfold. So just to know that that's coming. Anyway, moving on, ransomware attack divulges data for almost a million patients. Again, this is crosses boundaries with the HIPAA. And I put a couple of red items in here. Practice resources. So that's a software vendor. I haven't looked deep into them, but I, I'm assuming it's software. Perhaps they do software in a little bit of a hardware platform. Let me know in the notes. Um, recently notified that 942,000 plus patients had their data access or stolen ahead of a ransomware attack that was deployed in April. April, keep that in mind. A ransomware attack was launched against Practice Resources on April 12th, prompting the vendor to secure the systems and investigate the incident. They found PII, personally identifiable information, and health data, so we have PII, which could impact certain rules in different states. Let's say if you're uh, California, California has a CCPA, which really hones in on the, on the PII for people in California and businesses that do work with folks in California. So that may be subjected to your state rules. Also, uh, HIPAA, HIPAA broad-based. Uh, the exposed data includes names, contact details, dates of treatment, and health plan or medical record numbers. It doesn't mention whether these are out on the dark web, but I suspect, my bet is they're selling this information out on the dark web. Now notice that I put in red, according to HIPAA, 60 days of discovering the breach, that's your window for notification. Now, if you're looking at different compliances, let's say DOD, NIST 800-171, the DFARS requires 72 hours, CCPA not looking into the California Consumer Privacy Act, that requires a certain length of time before reporting. So these people were not, quite frankly, were not on target with uh, reaching out and revealing that they've been hacked. I mean, my God, it's August. They reported on Tuesday. Today's the 26th. So Tuesday was, if I can do my math right, the 23rd. Anyway, I'm not going to edit it, <laughs> but you get the point right here. So uh, that's an, a compliance issue, but it's also a cybersecurity issue in the sense that uh, once you know you're hacked, you re really... Agencies really need to report it because the word gets around to other organizations. And uh, then patches, prevention, policies, procedures, et cetera, can be adhered to uh, or applied in order to kind of tighten that realm, if you will.
A couple more. DDoS. We love DDoS, don't we? So if you've taken any kind of certs on uh, cybersecurity, DDoS is talked about all the time. Denial, distributed denial of service. Um, I got impacted by this. I teach at two schools part time right now. And it was, they both use Quick Launch. Quick Launch is a, a wonderful product. However, Quick Launch did suffer a DDoS attack. Um, and down here, it, it experienced intermittent outages throughout Monday. Actually, I, I for the two schools that I, I work at, it was pretty solid outage. But uh, there were some workarounds for each school. Again, Quick Launch is uh, a one portal that provides multiple services, good tool. So this Tuesday, August 23rd, the company said it was a victim of a DDoS with hackers flooding the system with password reset request, impact, impacting, quote, tightly coupled identified infrastructure, unquote, and causing the login process to become sluggish. Heck, I couldn't even get in. I mean, I tried both universities many, many times. Update was published at 3.45 on Tuesday. Still, I have found with both schools, it's, today is Friday, it, it's a little sluggish, but that's the power of DDoS. I think the company was quick to respond, good product. Uh, and many of these products that we mentioned here are, are really solid products, just the hackers are uh, wiggling into uh, an environment and leveraging their ability to cause us disruption. Anyway, um, popular router. I have used Aries before. I believe that's how it's pronounced. Aris. Aris. I've always said Aries, but Aris. Aries. Let me know how it's pronounced uh, in the notes. Um, MIT license MU HTTPD uh, web servers, a little web server component that was burnt on one of Aris's. Uh, chipsets, if you will. Uh, the HTTP is a simple, complete web service written in ANSI C. And uh, if you've taken C classes with me, we've talked about the vulnerabilities in C. It's a wonderful language. Uh, however, there's different processes to kind of secure your code. Uh, the Georgia-based network equipment company's line of routers has been identified via, and here's the CVE score. And if you're just learning about the CVE scores, I put a note here, CVE is a publicly accessible database. Yeah, you can use it as a hacker to find some intel out, you know. Uh, but that's where things are reported shared around via SIM. We'll talk about SIMs at one point in time, but the CVE database is publicly accessible. It has a rating scale of vulnerabilities, uh, what product, what proposed patches, uh, mitigations you can take. So th that's available. Look under CVE score database if you're curious about that. However, there is a CVE score, CVE 2022, the date. Uh, 319, I'm sorry, 31793, 31,793. So there you go. Uh, the mitigation, if your router uses a vulnerable version of MUHTTP, you are advised to disable the remote administration, which means you'll have to do it some, you'll have to use that facility in another way, shape, or form. Uh, since the, that limits the exploitability of the vulnerability to LAN attacks. Also, um, there's a patch out for uh, Aris routers, Aris? Aries, Aries routers, and um, or quite frankly, frankly, replace the device. But then again, you could be replacing it with another set of vulnerabilities. So we're we're at <laughs> that kind of quirky place, if you will. Always check, verify. I was going to say trust and verify, but I'm saying always don't trust and always don't verify. I mean, always do verify. Excuse me. I'm not going to edit that out. Anyway, here's the references if you're a student of mine or a student in general, if you're a researcher or just someone building up your cybersecurity chops. I just list these straight up. If you're doing a paper, of course, you're going to have to do it in APA or MLA, what have you. But these links are here. Um, I don't manage, monitor these links, of course, but let me know if any of them are broken. Uh, I will go out and find uh, if there's an alternate resource to support what we've talked about today. Again, uh, please like. I I just want to see how much I'm reaching the community. I keep banging my microphone. Please share if you like. Keep in contact. I have my LinkedIn information up on the first slide, and I'll also put in my LinkedIn on the notes, my email as well. So if you are one of my students, tell me what which one of the two schools you're from, or if you're not, just uh, you know, just let's let's chat. We can. I, th I think this stuff is really good. I'm going to try to do an update pretty consistently uh, about weekly with these cybersecurity updates. Hopefully this has given you some information that you find useful. 
And until later, signing off. Thank you. Bye now.